The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Musa Makwani from gt247.com. Um, before we begin, please indicate if you can hear me uh, by just uh, answering yes on the question panel, if you don't mind. Okay, so we're just going to wait uh, for about five minutes so that we just make sure everyone is ready to go. Um, if you're having any problems, please just let us know so that we can try and resolve them within the next five minutes and get started. All right. Good evening, guys. Um, I hope all of you are doing well on this lovely Thursday evening. Um, yeah, so as you might have seen from the communication that we sent through to you, uh, today we're going to be presenting on fundamental analysis. 
this is more of an introductionary approach uh, more than anything else. Um, so if you do have background in accounting or economics, you might be aware of some of the talks that, I, that I'm going to be talking about. But um, if you don't, uh, it's not a problem at all. I'm going to try my best to explain what fundamental analysis is in the simplest way possible. With regards to questions, um, I'm going to take some questions halfway through the presentation and the remainder of the questions are also take halfway or rather after the presentation. So if you have any questions that you might have, just jot them down for now and you can send them through on the questions panel on the webinar. And um, halfway through the, my presentation, I'll take a look at some of them and try and answer them in the best way that I can. Okay. All right, so to get started, uh, fundamental analysis is um, basically around us. Um, I like to use the term that uh, fundamental analysis is a look at the bigger picture of what's going on around us, right? With that in mind, um, if you do go to Google and do a Google search or try to find uh, the definition in many textbooks which are out there, you have come across at least 50 variations of what fundamental analysis is. Um, but for the purpose of this, dis of this discussion, and in line with what we do here at gt247.com, I've decided the following definitions will be most suitable for our discussion. All right, so by definition, fundamental analysis is a method of securities research that focuses on a company's operational and financial situation and future prospects ra rather than the level of its share price relative to the market, which is in other words called Tinko analysis. Uh, most of you traders out there might be aware of what technical analysis is, but I'm not going to touch on that for today. My colleague Barry will be touching more on what technical analysis is next week. So just be uh, on the lookout for that presentation or for that webinar that will be hosted next week. All right. So what's the goal of fundamental analysis? Why would we even do it at all? Um, so the goal is to attempt to understand and predict the intrinsic value of stocks on an in-depth analysis of various economic, financial, qualitative, and quantitative factors. Um, do not be scared by the jargon. It's all fancy jargon, but um, it's relatively um, terms that you come across on a daily basis or things that you come across on a daily basis. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, um, I like to call fundamental analysis a look at the bigger picture of what's going on uh, with the economy, uh, with your own life and uh, with the company that you might be looking to buy or trade. Okay. All right. So why would anyone use fundamental analysis? I mean, why not just buy it at a cheaper price or buy it when it's uh, when you think that's the right time to buy? Okay. So the goal with fundamental analysis is to try and focus future stock prices, right? And uh, fundamental fundamental analysis is uh, a combination of economic, industry in company analysis to derive what we call a stock's current uh, uh, fair value, or in accounting, they might use the term intrinsic value, right? And uh, using this intrinsic value, you can forecast what the possible future value of that stock might be, right? Um, so you've done your fundamental analysis, you have a fair value, let's say for this particular example, it's five rand, then so what, okay? So, if the current market value of the share, let's say for example today, um, Vodacom closed at one twenty as an example, right? If Vodacom closed at one twenty rand per share, and you've done your fundamental analysis and uh, you're getting a value of say a hundred rand per share, or rather, sorry, you're getting a fair value of rather say one fifty rand per share, which is higher than where Vodacom closed today. In that particular instance, that stock is deemed to be what we call undervalued, right? Because we are saying the share price at this current time is less than what I think the fair value or the correct price should be in the long run. And the inverse of that, uh, which is where you have a, a share price which is currently which is currently higher than the, what the fair value that you've uh, calculated. In that case, that stock would be deemed 
overvalued. Because we're saying this stock is much more expensive relative to what value I've calculated as the normal value or what I'll be prepared to pay for this particular stock. Okay. And then the last option, we do have a, a situation where you have the current market price is equal to the fair value, intrinsic value. Um, this situation is very rare. And uh, if it happened, if you are an investor or a trader, you should be worried because it means we do not have a market anymore. Because the whole idea behind the market is that we have different people who are looking at all these financial instruments and giving them different values at any point, in, at any point of time or at any particular time. So if you do get a situation where the entire market believes that, no, that price is, is the right price for a share, then the market ceases to exist. Ideally, the difference of opinion is what creates a market in the first place. Okay. All right, carrying on. There are three main areas um, that we focus on when we're conducting fundamental analysis. Um, I'm going to elaborate on them just a little bit. Uh, we have what they call the microeconomic uh, factors, uh, which is basically a branch of economics that studies the behavior and performance of an economy as a whole. We have the microeconomic view, which is a study of individuals, um, households, and firms' uh, behavior and decision making and allocation of resources. And lastly, which I feel is the most important one is company analysis, i.e. analysis of a company's financial statements, uh, which includes balance sheets, cash flow statements, income statements, uh, production updates, as well as trading updates um, on our local exchange. All right, so what is uh, the macroeconomic view? So the macroeconomic view primarily looks at those three things, uh, the GDP numbers uh, locally, with Statistics SA releasing those numbers um, almost on a quarterly basis. Um, we look at unemployment rate, uh, which is also released by Statistics SA, as well as the inflation rate. Uh, with the GDP rate, we are talking about uh, how much uh, an economy is producing. Uh, in this particular instance, we're talking about the African economy as a whole. Right? So if the South African economy is doing well, um, factories are producing goods, uh, miners are producing, um, are mining their products and we're exporting to other markets. That in turn has a knock-on effect on uh, the unemployment rate. Was ideally, if the, if the economy is producing at full speed, we would find a reduction in the unemployment rate as we require more people to be economically active for us to remain uh, productive. And uh, we have the inflation rate, uh, which is also a, um, a component which most people would confuse as being bad. So I just want to highlight the one fact that uh, inflation is not always bad. Actually, we need a situation where we have inflation in the economy because that means we are producing. If you get to a point where we have a uh, negative inflation or which is also called deflation, that is bad for the economy because it means we're not producing enough uh, within the economy to allow for the expansion of uh, the economy as well as uh, for the participation of people within the economy itself. So inflation is not necessarily bad. It just needs to be maintained within a range that we can manage as a country and which will allow us to produce and remain competitive with other market economies. All right. Going on to the next uh, view, uh, the, micro, the microeconomic view. So this is the one that affects you as an individual, right? And in this particular instance, we're talking about the price of goods. If the price of goods increases, um, it will affect how much you're going to spend on that. So it has a direct impact on your individual expenditure, right? If the price also changes, it, it affects how much of that particular good you're going to demand. So for example, if you're buying a um, cooking oil, for example, previously at a price of 10 Rand, if it increases to 20 Rand, are you still going to buy the same quantity or, and as frequently as you were doing in the past? And then it also affects your consumption as an individual, right? Um, are you going to cons consume the same amount of um, cooking oil if the price is uh, doubles within a single night? And um, for the producers, um, if the cost of goods to produce increases, um, how much more are you still going to produce? Are you going to be able to maintain that level of production um, within your factory? 
If not, that also has a direct impact on the macroeconomic view, um, particularly for the unemployment rate. Was the effect to start to produce less, they might need to let go of some workers in order to maintain their costs relatively low. And then number six, we're talking about wages. Uh, the wages that you receive in increased net rate, which allows you to maintain your expenditure over the long term. And um, it also applies to, to factories or producers. Are they able to maintain wages in such a way that they can continue to uh, pay their workers well on time and um, to produce at the same quantities that they had previously produced? And number seven, the cost of inputs. Um, would they still be able to get raw materials at a relatively decent price? If not, what's going to be the impact on the quantity produced by the producers? And lastly, number eight, your individual investor, or rather, your individual investment as an individual. Um, after you spent money on all these things, how much more do you still have in place for you to invest in, um, say, stocks, for example, or even trade? So these are all factors which play and affect you as an individual in your day-to-day -day life. And um, these are also the things that you also use in fundamental analysis when you're making an assessment for a company to try and uh, gauge whether it's a good investment or not. I can give, give you a good example of a retail company, or a retailer, let's say uh, one that's popular, we can use the example of uh, Truett, right? If uh, people don't, if people's wages are not increasing as high as, as they were previously, goods like uh, clothes start to become luxury goods, uh, meaning they are now becoming out of reach for most people. And essentially that will reduce the demand uh, for goods in Truett, right? And if the demand for goods and trucks is less, that has a direct impact on earnings for trucks. Right? And when the results come out uh, in the next quarter, we'll see that impact in the results. And if you are an investor or a shareholder, if that happens, um, that will not be good for you. So you're more than likely you're going to sell off your shares. And we have a large number of uh, investors looking to sell their shares, which will lead to a depreciation in the share price for trucks. So it's a whole chain that is involved here. Uh, when you're looking at a company um, besides the price. Okay. And lastly, uh, company analysis. So this one is more um, accounting or it's most inclined to the side of accounting, but um, it involves analyzing the company's balance sheets, um, income statements, cash flow statements, production updates, and trading updates. I do understand that most of us might not have the time or liberty to have uh, to try and analyze balance sheets and income statements. But the nice thing nowadays is that uh, when a company releases um, their financials, they normally highlight the key features or the key financial highlights for that year. So these are some of the things that you can look out for when you're looking for a company's results, especially if you're looking to make a quick trading decision. Because essentially, you might not have enough time to go through the whole balance sheet or income statement or cash flow statement. But if you look at those key, finan those key financial highlights, that can assist you in making a quick decision as to whether it's a buy or sell within that short space of time. I'll chat a bit more about, um, about uh, the income statements and the financial highlights a bit later on. Uh, I'm just going to carry on for now. If you have any questions, just uh, tap them down and I'll, yeah, I'll answer them as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about these two main approaches to fundamental analysis, uh, and then I'll take some questions uh, thereafter. Okay. All right, so when it comes to fundamental analysis, uh, there are two main approaches uh, that uh, as a fundamental analyst you should use or that you can use. There's no right way or wrong way of doing it. Um, it all depends uh, on what company you're looking at and um, what factors have been the driving force for price movements at that particular time. Um, okay, so starting off with the top-down approach, right? The top-down fundamental analysis approach is basically uh, analysis starting from the macroeconomic level, or in other words, I'll say the bigger picture, or, um, and I've used the word bigger picture a couple of times now, but that's the best way to de describe what a macroeconomic level is. 
So you're starting by looking at global factors which are affecting the stock and you move down to narrower consecutive uh, economic levels until you reach the company itself to analyze what the company is all about. So the top-down approach, uh, the graph will look something like this. Right? So if the global economy at the top, the local economy, uh, the individual sector, the industry, and the specific business. So if you're using today's examples, for example, uh, if you're looking at a company like, um, what's a good example, like uh, for the, let's, let's start with MTN, right? So with MTN, uh, they've been having some troubles in Nigeria, right? And um, to sort of understand what they've been going through, you need to sort of uh, have an idea of what the Nigerian economy is like and um, the numbers that we're dealing with in terms of revenue uh, that, that comes from Nigeria for MTN. Right? And um, that's a very big uh, uh, portion of their revenues. Right? So if you have an idea of how, of how Nigeria is doing as an economy, that has a direct impact on MTN. Then coming down locally as well, um, locally MTN is, is competing with some uh, big guns in the telecom sector. You have your Vodacoms, your telecom and your cell C who are all coming with more aggressive uh, measures to tackle the data market. And that ultimately has an impact on MTN as well. And then with regards to the sector itself, um, we could look at say barriers to entry. How many people have the access or can easily penetrate the uh, telecom sector? And in that regard, you can say, okay, maybe they do have an advantage. It's only four competitors for now. And then the industry, itself um, you can take a look and say is it in a decline or is it uh, an expanding industry um, recent data shows that in terms of uh, voice calls the industry is in a decline but um, in terms of data there's two a wide market that mtn and other tele telecoms providers can still tap into and then lastly you will look at the specific business to say okay um, has the business made profit over the past years um, how much sales have they made um, how much have they returned to shareholders as dividends and so on. And these are the factors that you, that you are going to use to arrive to your decision to either invest uh, in MTN or not invest. Okay. All right. And the bottom of approach is simply the inverse of what I've just described. So you're simply starting at the bottom, uh, which is the company itself and you build your way up, up until you get to the macroeconomic view, which is all the things which affect uh, that particular company uh, from a global scale and locally. Okay. And this is what the graph would look, look like. So it's a similar graph, but the main difference is you're starting with uh, looking at the business itself. Okay. All right. Um, I'll take some questions for now, if there are any questions uh, that you guys might have. All right, guys, I have a question from uh, Matthew Sebenejo. Um, I think this is, a very big, this is a very good question. And the question is, um, for a short-term trader, does fundamental analysis matter? And um, yeah, the answer to that is yes, um, it does matter. Uh, but I think the key thing above all is to be able to use fundamental analysis uh, with tank analysis, right? So, Tenko analysis will help you in deciding when to buy, 
right? That's the ma major goal with Tinko analysis. Um, and fundamental analysis will help you with regards to uh, whether you should be buying or not, right? So fundamental analysis essentially will help you with the direction. Uh, you have done your analysis, um, you are sure that the industry is in a decline, as an example, you, understand, you know that you should be selling that particular stock, right? So you know what you're supposed to be doing. But with regards to actual buying levels, that is where Tank Analysis comes in. So if you use a combination of this with your Tank Analysis, it will help you or it will give you an edge as compared to someone who's simply looking at charts. Um, I hope that answers your question, uh, Matthew. And then there's another question with regards to um, the bottom-up approach and the top-down approach as to which one should come first and uh, which one is most applicable. So it comes down to the industry, um, essentially. Um, I'll give you an example of the miners on the JSE, for example. Um, miners have different cost profiles, and that's one of the biggest uh, measures or the biggest tools uh, which determines whether they'll re remain profitable or not, right? So ideally, if you're doing a comparison for miners, uh, you should be looking to pick a miner who's producing at the lowest cost possible. Because if you're producing at the lowest cost possible, that, that, that gives you leeway to get a good price with regards to your goods, regardless of where the market is with regards to commodities. Remember, the commodities market is... Um, it's not a stable market, it's a very volatile market and it changes on a daily basis. And um, if you do understand the cost structure of some of these businesses, it can give you an idea as to whether the business has the potential to remain profitable uh, over the long term, which can guide your buying decision within the, the short term. Um, but then on the, on the flip side, if you're looking at a financial company or a bank, for example, uh, then the macroeconomic uh, factors might become a, a bigger factor. So, for example, if tonight we have the U.S. Fed uh, announcing its interest rate decision, that has a direct impact on local banks because uh, it increases the, or rather, depending on the outcome of that interest rate decision, that's going to affect the cost of borrowing for banks with um, other external financial players. Because remember, around the globe, most prices are quoted in U.S. dollars. So, should the Fed raise rates uh, globally? It will increase the cost of borrowing for local banks if they are doing trading with other banks which are offshore. And uh, locally, um, that will also affect their bottom line in the long run because it, it means their cost of production or cost of sales is going to increase. And um, ultimately, um, it, will, it will affect the revenues of the business because um, they are now have to pay more in terms of uh, foreign currency um, was, was normally a rate hike in the U.S. would see the U.S. dollar appreciating and our local rand depreciating. So it's something that you can't ignore. Um, but yeah, you sort of have to look at what, what industry the company that you're looking at uh, is in. So if it's more production-based, it's depending on raw materials, then it's wiser to start with the bottom-up approach. If it's more financial or more service-based, then it's much more wiser to start with the top-down approach. Okay, there's one question about uh, taxes. Um, unfortunately, uh, I cannot answer anything related to tax uh, because we're not licensed to offer any advice at all on taxes. Um, it would be more prudent for you to consult a registered tax advisor uh, because yeah, tax is, is a very touchy issue and uh, there are uh, legal implications involved so it's always best to get uh, the best opinion uh, from a tax consultant who can guide you accordingly with regards to that um, but if you're an investor or a trader there's definitely tax implications involved 
But for more details on that, um, it's best that you contact a registered tax consultant. Okay, so that's all for the questions for now. I'm going to continue with the remainder of my presentation. All right, so we've talked about uh, the top-down approach. We've talked about um, the main approaches to, to fundamental analysis. Uh, you have all this information at your fingertips. It's on your desk. You have put company financials. Uh, you have looked at the newspaper, business day, or whatever it might be. But then so what? What do you use this information for? Right. What do you need to look at? So there are five main critical elements that you need to look out for as a fundamental analyst. And uh, the nice thing is that uh, when a company releases uh, its financials, these are normally highlighted in the financial statements. Um, so I'm just going to name them for now and I'll explain them in the following slides. So we have what they call um, earnings per share, uh, the price to earnings ratio, the price to book ratio, the debt to equity ratio, and lastly, the return on equity. Uh, we call this, uh, these uh, elements uh, financial ratios, and there's a whole universe of them, but these are the main five that uh, if you do take a look at whenever you are trying to analyze a company, they will assist you in coming to a decision as to whether to invest in a company or buy a stock. All right, so any special. Um, so this is the easiest ratio, which is used by, by companies for comparison uh, when it comes to profitability. Um, if you watch Bloomberg or CNBC, when the companies release results, they normally hammer on this number uh, because uh, this is a very important number, especially if you are a shareholder for that particular company. And the calculation is fairly simple. It's simply the net profit that's, uh, that the company declares, uh, and you divide that by the number of outstanding shares that the company has. Um, so it's a very easy number to derive. And um, obviously, the, the important thing to remember with these numbers is that um, they are useless without a comparison. Right? So if you calculate any of these ratios that you are going to be calculating, they are only as useful comparing the, the, the data to a similar data from a previous period or with a similar company in a similar industry. Right? Right, so any special, uh, the guys from Bloomberg and um, CNBC like to ham on that. That's a very important number for companies. It's uh, the easiest com comparison for profitability. And then we have the price to earnings ratio, uh, which is uh, one of the mostly widely used, or rather, most widely used valuation uh, ratio in financial analysis. And uh, what this is is simply, um, it's a ratio of the current price of the stock divided by the earnings per share, which you've calculated, calculated um, here. So you can't derive this number without getting the earnings per share from here. Okay, and the PE ratio essentially it um, you're trying to calculate um, how cheap or inexpensive a share is. Right? So ideally, the lower the num this number is, um, the cheaper the stock is. Because what the PE ratio implies is simply a measurement of how long it will take you to recoup um, your investment in terms of number of years. So say, for example, in this particular case, we have a stock price at uh, 10 rand per share, and uh, we calculated previously our earnings per share to be 2 rand per share, or to be 2, rather. So you simply divide the stock price of 10 rand per share divided by 2, which gives us a P-E ratio of 5. And what this simply means is that um, we require at least 5 years for us to recoup our investment in this particular share. Right? But again, this number in isolation is not useful. You have to compare it with similar companies in a similar industry and a similar sector. So, for example, if you're comparing retailers, uh, say you're comparing ShopRite to Woolworths, right? You, if, if the P-E ratio for Woolworths is 5 and for ShopRite is 10, on the face value of P-E ratios, that means ShopRite is relatively more expensive than Woolworths because it will take you longer to recoup your money if you invest in ShopRite is compared to Woolies. So ideally, when we are using PE ratios, we are looking for low PE ratios um, as a measurement uh, for investment. And you want uh, to invest in a company with the lowest PE ratio given all things being equal. Okay. Um, 
The nice thing is that on the JSC, this is still very much applicable for most stocks uh, on our exchange. But um, if you look at some of the companies that we have nowadays, especially with your tech companies, this uh, ratio is becoming more, less useful because um, some of these companies have valuations which are massive. And uh, subsequently, um, if, if you compare the price of the stock uh, to the earnings per share, you get P ratios which are ridiculous and times in the thousands or hundreds. So in, that, in those particular instances, the P-E ratio becomes less significant. But um, for our local market, we can still use uh, the P-E ratio to come to an investment decision with most of the stocks on the JAC. Okay, the price to book ratio. Um, most uh, analysts will not use this number, but it's also a nice, uh, an, a nice view to have with regards to your company's assets. So this is simply um, the total... Uh, the total value of a company's assets that shareholders would receive if a company were to shut down. So you simply take the closing stock price for that particular day and you divide it by this book value and uh, most companies will give you um, the book value for this company in their, or for their company in their financial statements. And then uh, with the debt to equity ratio. Um, this is also a significant number but it simply measures um, how much a company is borrowed uh, relative to its total shareholders' equity. Right? So remember, every business that is uh, running on, around the world will have uh, some sort of borrowings, right? but the extent to which they are borrowed is the one that differs. Uh, in some cases, businesses may be over-borrowed, some, some businesses are under-borrowed. And yes, you, there are cases where you can be under-borrowed. It's, it's not always a nice thing for a business not to have any liabilities. Right. So the debt to equity ratio is simply a measure of how leverage the company is relative to its shareholders' equity. So ideally, you do not want your liabilities to outstrip or to outnumber the amount of equity that you have in your hands. Right. And traditionally, uh, the number that's been seen as prudent for a company to have as this debt to equity ratio is uh, 0 0.5 or in other words, 50%. And by that I simply mean that your total liabilities should be at least or at the very most, or rather ideally should be 50% of your total shareholders' equity. Um, what this allows you to do is that um, should the, the worst come to happen, you, you have enough equity to cover those liabilities. Right? But um, with the tech space coming up and uh, with the valuations that we are seeing in stocks such as uh, Nasdaq, Baidu, and Alibaba, we're now saying that this debt equity ratio can easily be 100% which is fine uh, as long as the business has the cash flows as, or has enough revenue streams to service that debt. So it's also important to look at the context of um, the company when you're analyzing the debt to equity ratio. But uh, for a small company, um, you don't want this debt to equity ratio to be greater than one. Because uh, greater than one means the company is over indebted and it might struggle to pay off that debt unless if it's a uh, producing um, or if it's growing at more than a, more than 100% for that particular year. All right, and lastly, uh, the return on equity. So the return on equity um, is what is the number that you should be looking at as a shareholder. Um, that is basically a measure in percentage of how much uh, the company is going to return to you as a shareholder relative to the amount of shares which are an issue. So it's simply calculated as a net income divided by shareholders' equity, and it's normally expressed as, as a percentage, and uh, most companies will term this ROE, return on equity. And um, yeah, that's a number that as a shareholder you should be looking at. And also, it's also important to compare to the similar companies in a similar industry. Um, because if you're in the tech space, for example, um, most companies are returning around 40% for their shareholders. Uh, if your company returns 20% and they're also in the same industry, yes, 20% is good, but relative to their peers, they've underperformed. So that can also be something that you can use to arrive to an investment decision to, uh, for a particular company. All right. So yeah, I'm just touching again on what I was saying with regards to comparisons uh, in that um, 
these five elements that I've been speaking about are best used in comparison with similar companies, ideally in a similar market segment and under similar microeconomic conditions. Right? Um, like any data, data is only as useful as, um, um, as you can compare to a similar set of data. Um, and uh, comparison allows for measurement of improvement or decline. So if I told you to, uh, this, year, this year I made 20%, Yes, I made 20%, but in comparison to what? If I made 80% last year and uh, this year I make 20%, yes, I've done well, but in comparison to last year, I haven't done so well. So that, that's why I, I keep hammering on the point uh, to say that comparison is very important and it's important to understand the context that you are looking at a company at when you're doing your fundamental analysis. All right, so let's take a look at some uh, real life examples. Um, these are financial snippets from uh, clicks for 2017 and uh, 2018. On the left, that's for 2017, and for, on the right, that's for 2018. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, the nice thing is that uh, most companies will highlight to you the key financial highlights. Uh, like in this case here, clicks has highlighted some of the key um, highlights that you as a trader uh, need to look out for when you're making a decision. So these are all the tools that you can use. Uh, if you know a company is going to be released results tomorrow, as soon as it comes out, so these are these what you should be looking for to arrive to that quick buying or selling decision with regards to a stock, right? So on the left, let's take a look at uh, Group Turnover. Uh, in 2017, it was up 10%. Um, health and beauty turnover was up 14.3%, and uh, cash from operations was was um, 1.1 billion rand. Uh, diluted airline ends per share were up 14.8% and uh, the interim dividend was up 16.5%. All very good numbers. Um, if I'm a shareholder uh, looking at that, at that 2017 snippet, that would make me happy. But now let's go to 2018. And uh, group turnover was up 9.1%. It's too healthy, but if I compare to 2017, that is slightly less because in 2017, uh, group turnover grew by 10%. So if you are a serious investor, you're not looking to dig deeper to say, okay, what was the cause of this uh, dip in turnover for, for this particular year? And then we we'll take a look at uh, health and beauty sales. They are up 11.7%, which is still good, but it was less than four, it was lesser than the previous year when it was 14.3%, right? But then on the positive side, uh, in 2018, this business managed to generate more cash from its operations. So they generated up to 2.5 billion in cash from the operations. And if I compare to 1.1, or rather to 2017, where it was 1.1 billion, that is relatively good news for me because it means this business is uh, very solvent and has enough cash uh, for their day to day operations, which would make me happy as an investor. And the nice thing as well, the, the earnings per share, diluted earnings per share, we have 15.1%. So as a shareholder, the business managed to return more for me as a shareholder. And um, the total dividend was up 18% for the year, which is also a happy days if you are a shareholder. All right, and then uh, they were included in the JSC Top 40 Index. Uh, some of you might ask, okay, so what, why is this important? All right. As you know, um, or as some of you might know, the JSC um, uh, has a quarterly rebalancing of shares. And every quarter, um, some companies are added to the top 40 and some are removed from the top 40. So if you're added to the top 40, uh, most fund managers who are in, invested in the top 40 index uh, will be inclined to buy some of your stock in order to rebalance their portfolios. So that has a positive impact on the share price in the long run. So that's why it's a highlight here. It's a positive thing for the business that for the business that they were included in the top 40, particularly for the share price. Okay. Now next page, we're taking a look at um, EOH. Uh, on the left side, that's 20, that's for 2017, and on the right side, that's for 2018. Okay. So 2017, everything was a uh, honky dory. Revenue up 21 percent, operating profit up 29 percent, earnings per share up 17 percent, um, dividends up 16 percent, and cash from operations was up uh, 29 percent. 
So if you were an investor in 2017 uh, and a shareholder, you would have been smiling all the way to the bank uh, to collect your dividends. Uh, but then now, in 2018, things weren't going so well. Uh, as some of you know, there was uh, some stories or some neg negative press with regards to EOH, and um, that resulted in a decline in revenue, um, or rather in a decline in, in operating profits. So revenue did increase to $16.2 uh, billion, but um, there was a drop in operating profit to $1.1 billion from $1.7 billion. And that is a very significant jump, or significant drop rather. And then normalized earnings uh, before interest and tax were down to 1.7 billion from 2.1 billion. Right. So this, these are sort of comparisons, comparisons rather, you need to make as an investor when you are looking to invest in a share. This is the type of information you should be digging for. Um, it does look like a boring process, but um, it is. That's the process you have to go through to come to whether you are going to be buying a stock or to be looking to sell a stock. All right. Uh, this was South 32, but um, yeah, I'm not going to take a look at that because it's more in a, in, a, in accounting format. And um, yeah, it, some of you, some of you might struggle to comprehend it. But it's basically a similar story where they are comparing uh, the earnings from the one year to the other and comparing it to, to, the, to the next year. So the point that I'm trying to drive home in all of this is that um, in fundamental analysis, the biggest thing to, to do is to compare the data that you get with similar data from a corresponding period and with companies in a similar industry. That's how you come to the right, right buying decision or right selling decision. Okay, so in all this, I'm trying to highlight to you the importance, the importance of perspective. Um, right here, I have a chart for a certain um, asset that is listed on, the, on one of the exchanges in the world. And um, where I've circled in green um, is where it was last traded uh, on October, uh, I think it was October 2nd, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So just by looking at face value, um, if you're only doing tanker analysis, I've drawn, a, I've drawn a trend line here, which is in red. Um, and tail analysis will tell me, listen, this thing is bouncing off this trend line and uh, possibly there might be some room for this thing to, um, to bounce from here and uh, reach its most recent highs. Right. So if I were to post the question to you, um, how many of you will be buying uh, this instrument here based on tank analysis alone? Um, I'm sure most of you would raise your hands to say, hey, this is a good buy. Um, it has bounced off this particular um, uh, trend line is looking good for a nice pullback and you can make some nice profit there. Um, so yeah, taking just at the face value, um, this chart looks great. These are the type of setups that you're looking for as a trader, you know, so that you, you can arrive at a buying decision. But then if I take a look at the same slide and I zoom out of the chart uh, over the next period, this is what the chart looks like. So where it's circled in white, um, that is why I had that initial trend line, which is in red. That's where my trend line was crossing, and uh, that, that's where I got a buy signal from my charts. Right? But look at where, what the stock did, and this, this is where it was um, towards the end of October, right? uh, where I've circled in red. So from an internal perspective, you, you wouldn't have done anything wrong because th that's what the charts were telling you, right? But then, uh, if we knew what stock we were buying or what instrument we were buying, if I go to the next page, we take a look, that is NASPAS, right? And uh, we have uh, the classic head and, form head and shoulders formation here, which is um, one of the classic bearish, bearish signals if you are a trader. Uh, when normally when you get this uh, formation, you should be looking to, sh to short a stock. And in this particular instance, we did get that uh, head and shoulders formation. I'm not going to touch much on it. My colleague Barry will touch on it next week when he does uh, the presentation on take analysis. But um, if you if you seen the head and shoulders formation and gone short, you are a very happy trader. You have made some loot or you've made some money and um, everything is happy days for you. But then at the same time, if you knew that uh, you're looking at NASPERS, there are some key elements that you should have looked at um, before 
you made the buying decision purely based on the trend line that we saw here. So I see the trend line, but I know this is NASPERS. Okay. And what is going on with NASPERS? What has caused that downtrend? So with NASPERS over the past couple of months, over the past two months to be exact, uh, we did see its, um, its subsidiary, uh, which is uh, Tencent Holdings. Uh, it recorded a rate decline in net income for the, for the second quarter. And uh, this was due to a lack of sales of, of some of pop, for some of its popular games games rather right and why is there been a lack of sales the chinese government or the chinese regulators have, have cracked down on uh, these online gaming companies in china to say listen your games are very much addictive for young people and uh, they need to cut down or reduce some elements of their games right and uh, this also requires us to understand how big the online gaming market is in china and how big of a player tencent Holdings is in that particular space yeah. So the online gaming uh, environment in China is massive and it's a massive revenue driver for Tencent and they've been at the forefront of um, producing games for that particular market. So the Chinese government uh, cracking down on these online games. Um, this has reduced the amount of playing time that uh, particularly young people have spent on these games. And this has been a key, excuse me, this has been a key driver of their revenue over the past couple of years. And to add so to Add sort uh, to injury, the company is now struggling to, to secure approval of its, of its new games, of its new games from Chinese authorities, and uh, this has raised uh, concerns of more declining revenue going forward from investors, right? And uh, as a result, we've seen Tencent um, on the Hang Seng coming down from as high as $150 uh, per share. It's now trading in the $290 per share range, and uh, as of uh, two weeks ago, it was down to below $250 per share. And that is a very big move for such a big company. And um, as some of you might be aware, NASPERS has a significant holding in the company, uh, which is just now just a little over 30%. And most of the revenue have been coming from Tencent over the past years. So how do we suffer as investors? NASPERS is invested heavily in Tencent, right? It's a big revenue driver. Locally, NASPERS is about uh, is more than 20% of our overall exchange, right? So whether invested in NASPERS itself or even the Statrix Top 40 Index, um, we are going to feel the impact of uh, these decisions that have been made in China on Tencent, just because by how massive um, NASPERS is on our exchange and how massive Tencent is in uh, the Chinese uh, gaming space. Okay, so uh, this is just, just to highlight why, how important the bigger picture is. Um, I believe I've come to the end of my presentation. All right, so I, I have come to the end of my presentation. I will take a couple more questions uh, from you guys. I believe we do have a couple of minutes left. Um, yeah, if there's anything you need me to clarify, uh, please just uh, shoot. And I'll try my best to answer in the best way that I can. Um, Mervyn, to answer your question on uh, the net profit for the EPS calculation, um, ideally that would be the net profit after tax. So you want to use the net profit after tax after you've taken into account each and every aspect um, of uh, any amount that needs to be subtracted. So ideally it should be net profit after tax.
Uh, Matthew, yes, uh, with regards to your question on uh, cash from operations, uh, you're asking if it's different from revenue or sales. Um, so it's, it's not entirely different, uh, but remember different businesses um, have different ways of, of, of doing sales. Um, so for the retailers in particular and clothing retailers, uh, they do have a large number of their sales on credit. So they're not necessarily cash sales, um, it will be a sell on paper, but most of them are not, may not be cash sales. So when they say cash from operations, um, this is a direct cash transactions which the business has done, which are bringing cash directly into their bank account with no uh, lag from the date of uh, transaction. All right, with regards to the diluted earnings per share, um, yeah, so depending on the accounting treatment that uh, the company is using, uh, the diluted earnings per share simply factors in um, what the earnings would be um, if all the company's uh, securities were exercised. And by that, I'm, I'm talking about preference shares, uh, because remember, preference shares are what we call debt instruments, right? So essentially, if you're a preference shareholder, you have uh, the first uh, preference when it comes to payout when a company is either liquidating or paying out dividends. So it's the diluted airline earnings per share would measure how much would be paid out um, if all these preference shares, um, if a company has debentures, it would factor in that as well. If a company has warrants or stock options, which are also uh, out in issue, it would factor in those uh, numbers before um, it presents a number. So you're simply taking out uh, any debt instruments that the company has an issue um, before you derive um, before you derive uh, your, net, your, your net profit. And that's the one that you use to calculate your diluted headline earnings per share. And then there's a question from uh, Shane Anderson. Uh, you're asking what fundamentals would one use when trading currency pairs? Um, all right. So yeah, the assumption is that <coughs> excuse me. The assumption is that you don't need uh, uh, much fundamental analysis when you are trading currency pairs, which is true to a large extent. Um, but there are certain uh, fundamentals that you can look at, and uh, you can start off um, by looking at the U.S. dollar index. Uh, most of you might have heard it, but it's simply um, a gauge of how strong the US dollar is relative to the six strongest currencies in the world. And the biggest uh, constituent of that basket is the euro. Right? So if the dollar index is rising, um, ideally, or all things being equal, we would see the other currencies in, in that basket moving in the opposite direction. So if the dollar is stronger, we'd expect the euro to be weaker. So in that in that instance, you want to be short on the euro on the euro dollar, for example. And if, if the US dollar index is also higher, it's also bad news for the rand. So you want to be sure you, you want to be short on the dollar rand. 
So I think that's the primary fundamental that you can use as a currency trader. There are other relationships uh, for the individual currency pairs. I'm sure my colleague Barry will touch more on that. For example, the relationship between gold and uh, the, the dollar yen, for example, the relationship between uh, dollar CAD and oil, and also have other relationships between um, um, between the euro and uh, of, and the dollar. Well, I mentioned the dollar anyway, but um, yeah, there are some relationships which are which which exists in the currency market, uh, which some guys might not be aware of, and I'll, I'll get my colleague Barry to touch more on that when he does his uh, technical analysis next week. Uh, but one of the biggest ones that, as a currency trader or even a stock trader, you need to be aware of is the inverse relationship between the U.S. dollar and gold. Right, that's a traditional safe haven play, and by that I simply mean that um, normally all things being equal, when the U.S. dollar is stronger you find that the demand for gold uh, will depreciate, right? And inversely, when the US dollar is weaker, people tend to buy safe haven assets like gold, and uh, you find that gold price will appreciate when the US dollar is uh, weakening. Uh, but we have my colleague Barry who will elaborate more on that next week when he does present on tanker analysis. All right, guys, that's all from me for today. Um, I hope you guys uh, learned something from my presentation. Um, sorry if I went on and on in terms of uh, just talking, but uh, yeah, I had to get my, my point across in the shortest time possible. If you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to email us. Uh, we're always here to assist. Um, if, you need any, if you need any help with your trading platforms or if you're struggling, uh, please don't hesitate to contact our support department. They are also available as we are speaking, and they'll be closing around 10:30 uh, a.m. Um, thanks for uh, logging in. Uh, appreciate you guys for coming through, and I'm sure I'll be chatting to you soon. Thank you.